Face it, you're different. Everyone is. Same goes for your banking needs. That's why Columbia Bank offers an impressive range of checking account solutions specifically designed for, well, you. Looking for high yield interest account? Check. Rewards program? Check. Cash bonuses? Mobile and online banking? Apple Pay? Check. You'll always find more checking choices for you. So check us out at your local Columbia Bank branch or columbiabankonline.com. Count on Columbia. Equal housing letter and member FDIC. Welcome to Audio Gyan with Kedar Nimkar, a podcast that documents insightful conversations with Indian designers, artists, musicians, writers, thinkers, and creatives of all types. Catch us on iTunes or visit audiogyan.com for more Gyan sessions. Here's your host, Kedar Nimkar. Today, I have Kruti Saraya with us on Audio Gyan. Kruti is a graphic designer, typographer based in Mumbai. The focus of our practice has been to allow for contemporary Indian design narratives to emerge and fill the gap between kitsch and traditional Indian crafts. She graduated from London School of Printing and she has worked with Rabia Gupta Designs, Mumbai. Uh, she also taught at uh, Shrishti School of Arts, Design and Technology, Indian School of Design and Innovation and Ecole Intuit for several years. So it's a, it's a real honor to have you uh, Kruti with us on Audio Gan and thank you for giving us your time. Well, very happy to be here. Thank you Kedar. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we'll be speaking about uh, like I've I've kept the topic name as language and typography. Uh, so we'll be exploring some bits of the uh, typography in general and the kind of work you have done and what was your creative process around it and things like that. So uh the first thing which i want to ask you is uh, you're a typographer but uh, you don't design fonts so can you tell us uh, what's the overall process about typography oh i love this question um so i actually want to you know start off explaining this concept with a quote from massimo vignelli oh, nice. who uh, actually said that you know out of the thousands of fonts that exist we need only a handful yeah. and the rest should be trashed <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah he says it's using a different font is like a criminal act actually <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. right yeah. so i actually have my own version of his quote and i the uh, based basically you know feel that the world has too many fonts mm-hmm. and not enough people who know how to use them mm-hmm. right and that is uh, the you know basis of actually like my practice mm-hmm. that uh, typography somehow seems you know largely synonymous with just type design mm-hmm. and like i come from a school where i feel that you know there's of course with great respect to type design and Uh, you know everybody out there who's doing that mm. but the world of typography is much larger than that mm-hmm. and there are various entry points into typography which go you know just beyond the form of how a letter looks mm-hmm. for me that entry point is actually language okay. and when i say language i mean like words just how they sound where they came from how they are spoken uh you know uh, the etymology he- of words exactly yeah. like all of that and as well as you know languages in terms of like you know the different languages that people speak mm-hmm. so i'm really interested in that i'm interested in uh you know what typography can do mm. uh when you have interesting stuff to say Mm-hmm. So every time I've taught typography I keep saying that that yes sure you can make you know something look good but that something needs to be there mm-hmm. and that is like you have to have a love for words you have to be able to think in words to be able to design in words mm-hmm. right if you think just visually mm-hmm. then you're never going to have a great typographic poster or packaging or something because you know i've not known any client or anybody who will come and tell you like oh i want a typographic logo mm-hmm. you know that ain't happening mm-hmm. so it's about like finding those nuances finding like the right catchy phrase you mm-hmm. know that fits into something and then you have you know you can propose a typographic design mm-hmm. so uh, my interest really comes you know in typography from language like from just 
grammar and like voice tone of voice mm mm-hmm. right so again i'm not talking about uh, you know stuff like that oh let's take the word dog and make it look like dog or let's you know write happy no. and make it look happy <laughs> but i'm actually talking about this tone of voice that just right now you know you said yeah and there was a giggle mm-hmm. so if i was you know to transcribe this interview mm. it would only say yeah but i need to kind of like hear the giggle behind that yeah like mm. i need to know that it wasn't an angry yeah or it wasn't a sad like or bored yeah like that it was an mm-hmm. amused yeah mm-hmm. and i feel like that's what typography can do and that's my interest in typography mm-hmm. oh yeah interesting because uh, just day before yesterday i I'm, i'm watching this series uh, abstract on netflix yes <laughs> and uh, it has a like uh, one of the episodes is on paul asher and uh, even she but her perspective of looking at type is like she looks at typography everywhere and then she builds on top of it so similarly what do you what do you see when you when you say that uh, it comes from words it comes from languages what is that you observe in your day to day life uh everything actually but more than seeing mm. uh i think for me it's audio mm. that i listen to people and i listen to them very carefully and i'm constantly picking up things whether it's from a movie whether it's from somebody i met whether it's a conversation with a you know taxi driver mm-hmm. uh that kind of stuff mm. uh for me like being in a new place where people speak a different language mm. is like you know being in wonderland mm. because i'm full of questions i'm full of like oh you know so what is punjabi for uh you know saying like how do you say how are you in punjabi and the mm. moment they will say that and i'm like is that formal is that informal mm. you know what happens there mm-hmm. so uh it for me like the audio part of like just listening to people finding meanings like my regular lunch table conversation with my parents mm-hmm. is full of all that so i'm gujarati mm-hmm. right and i will constantly so if there's a word that i kind of think of and i suddenly i'll be like okay so what's you know gujarati for exotic mm. and then apparently it became a you know whole large family conversation where and all of them have studied in gujarati medium mind you okay. uh, where they all you know had various suggestions of what exotic could possibly mean mm-hmm. but nobody really like could come to a consensus and then they said you know exotic is an english phenomena there is mm. no exoticness in gujarati <laughs> yeah but there has to be right and that brings out the difference in the culture also exactly yeah, yeah. so for me that that's what i like hear rather than see mm-hmm, mm-hmm. interesting interesting way to uh, perceive things actually uh that actually reminds me of one more thing also because i recently interviewed amrit gangar uh, who's a big film critic right and uh, and a historian and uh, like he's done a lot of study in films overall and uh, he mentioned that he was watching a film uh, made by kumar shahani right. and uh, robert bresso who was one of the people who were watching the film he was actually closing his eyes and taking a beat on the movie so he said that it's it's like a temporal medium rather than visual so it it i'm trying to connect the dots here <laughs> yeah so yeah. i actually like you know contrary to other designers who have like who take visual inspiration hmm. for me that inspiration is audio hmm. but the translation and that's you know that's what i think i do really well that i translate that audio into like visual typography mm-hmm. that then that but but doesn't it restrict as in there are chances of getting repetitive right because or that's what the skill is about like understanding or deciphering something from the voice i actually because the thing is that there is there are so many aspects to audio right so mm-hmm. there is uh, of course you know the tone of voice the emotion all of that mm-hmm. there's also just the way things sound and you know how they fit next to each other and then it sort of like all just comes together and makes sense mm-hmm. and then when you realize that 
poetry and typography hmm. you know so again like the kind of example that i'd like to give is that you know i was in kutch and i was uh, talking about finding my mojo hmm. to you know primarily like kutchi speaking audience who hmm. could speak english hmm. but um, and so i was you know really struggling to explain to them what the word mojo means hmm. right and then something happened and like one guy just looked at me and he said it's basically like maja hmm. you know hmm. and then that thing of you know so i have a typography piece that combines the two like it's mojo and maja hmm. Hmm. and you know the realization that these two words you know fit in so well together that they have similar sounding mm mm-hmm. you know yeah. so there's a lot of those kind of nuances that uh, really mm-hmm. excite me and mm-hmm. well you know i am very very far from feeling that it's repetitive or boring i mean i feel like you mm-hmm. know it's a very very long journey and there's lots to be explored oh, nice nice uh you've mentioned in couple of interviews also and this i found in your bio as well uh which is the key to change our mindset uh from an either or uh to an and so can you tell us uh, in what context it was and what makes you say that so um actually i'm going to start with you know taking you back to when i was a student in uh, london college of printing hmm. and you know i had a class with german people and japanese people and of course british people and all of that and but the reason i say german and japanese first because uh, they were you know as a like people they are very country proud mm-hmm. right so they would always like speak in german amongst them like the japanese girl would always like design in japanese mm. uh their keyboards would be customized you know like that like everything was you know so japanese mm. or so german mm. and i felt like i learned a lot about their cultures from just being in the same class with them and watching them design mm-hmm. and suddenly there was me and of course there was a bunch of other indians mm. um and we were just you know we thought in english we designed in english our design education was all about the west we knew everything about like you know bauhaus school of design yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know we knew what the germans knew but when they asked us like oh so what about india there was Hardly quite anything, yeah. yeah there was quite a big blank mm-hmm. you know in that space and i'm of course you know talking early 2000 mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. where this is like pre internet era where everything was not so available yeah. and all of that right the type foundries were not found yet yes <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh so there was and just in terms of information that you know it was the way you got information was by talking to other people mm-hmm. like the big amazing part of going abroad to study at that time was access to information mm-hmm. you know because they had the fantastic libraries you met different people who would tell you stuff about their unique cultures yeah. because things were documented yeah yeah because yeah. it wasn't available online mm-hmm. right there was no online mm. but when i went there that was the time i suddenly uh, you know had to turn around and say okay so what about my indian identity and mm. you know yes i can go on about helvetica but mm. like you know what about indian typography and as an indian typographer what is my voice mm-hmm. so very enthusiastically saying oh that's it you know i found my thing i'm going to work with vernacular type mm. and uh, i chose experimental typography as my specialization and what i've actually done is you know experimental typography with a specialization in non latin scripts mm. like that's what my final project was all about mm mm-hmm. and i did i graduated everything you know i was very well received in london all of that and uh, as a sparkly eyed student i landed back in india saying oh you know now i have this indian context and mm. i'm going to work with that mm. and then you come here and you're suddenly confronted with this big question saying acha but bhaiya which language mm-hmm. you know 
that if you are uh, going to design in Mar- Maharashtra, then is it Marathi? But then not everybody in Bombay understands Marathi. So mm. where is, you know, where is the market? And it's like, how many languages are there? And, you know, what do you do? And all of that, mm. right? And how do you find a commercial space for mm. this? No, like, but before that, what was going in your mind? I mean, like you have to so, get into languages, but what? Like, uh, is it? Is it I'm getting to yeah, that, yeah. right? So, so there was, as I said, that there was this idea of mm. the vernacular language, mm. and then saying, okay, so you know where and you know how. So the it led up to basically saying, what is my voice, mm. Mm. right? And saying my voice is that I'm predominantly Gujarati. Mm. So you know I've grown up speaking Gujarati at home. My mom is Kachi, so I also speak and understand a little bit of Kachi. Mm. There's the Bombay context, so there's, you know, Marathi, and there's the school context and the Bollywood context, so there's, of course, Hindi yeah. thrown in over there. Yeah. Uh, and then there was Bangalore, so there was Kannada. Mm. Right? So now, how do you take all these languages with all these varied scripts which you don't entirely understand mm-hmm. and bring it into design and how mm-hmm. right I guess that's also your question yeah, that what yeah. about those languages yeah, right yeah. and that was the same question that I was struggling with saying that okay interest is great mm-hmm. but what do you do with these mm-hmm. and uh, that's when I kind of like stumbled upon the fact that uh, what these languages actually do is that they hold certain cultural nuances. Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. Which are in that way not untranslatable. Like there is something that you lose. There is something that is better expressed in a certain language. Mm. Which the moment you translate it, it doesn't have the same feeling. It doesn't have the same power mm-hmm. so for instance there's a yeah I, this remembers actually there was one talk where I heard ki mujhe meri space chahiye ha. right so this space is itself a very different context which was not present in India that's why they had to borrow that borrow word. it yeah right yeah. and the, the, so the thing is that we are all as a urban Indian generation hmm. you know with our fancy English education and you know, a colonial hangover of sorts saying English is the language of progress, Mm. right? Have somewhere lost this thing of our mother tongue of, you know, what like we, we can all barely, you know, we hold on to our languages in a way that like, yes, I'm sure we can communicate with our parents, Mm. but I'm not sure we can teach it to our kids. Yeah, yeah. And the question is, so what if we can't, Mm. you know, so what if they are lost? Mm. But I think that along with language, you would lose stories and stories that, you know, have been passed on from generation to generation Mm -hmm. that talk about a much larger context of our culture and where you come from Mm -hmm. just through certain words. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for instance, uh, there is a phrase, and this is my most favorite story to tell, mm. um, that there is a phrase in Gujarati that goes, Bhes bhagode chas chagode. Mm. Right? I'm sure it sounds like complete garble to you right now. <laughs> no, no, I've read about it. Yeah. 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 So, so Bhes bhagode chas chagode very literally translated means like, don't make your buttermilk while before you bought the buffalo Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. which is again very you know kind of you can draw a very direct parallel to don't count your chickens before they hatch Mm -hmm. right now the thing is that the moment you you say oh but it's the same thing like Mm -hmm. so there is a translation Mm -hmm. but this base and chas business in Gujarat Mm -hmm. actually is very important right that to Every Gujarati, like that, chas is really important and mm. it talks of like an agrarian community. It talks of a vegetarian community where mm. like the chicken and eggs wouldn't exist. Mm. And then when I did further kind of, you know, deep di- uh, like investigation on the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the thing, right? I found out that there are similar phrases in Malayalam. There are similar phrases yeah. and they all 
just like they mean the same thing but the thing that they are talking about changes yeah, yeah. you know yeah. so chicken and egg becomes rice and something else you mm. know like that it's very localized yeah right and that tells you so it's like imagine that you'd put like 10 phrases like this together and you'd get to know about like a lifestyle of each wow. mm, mm. you know community mm, 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 right mm. and that's what like language holds within it mm, mm, that mm. it holds this like literally stories mm. that will you know that i think are worth holding on to mm. that are worth preserving mm, mm. and the best part of all of this which is where i'm going to kind of come back to your original question mm. is uh, that you know this realization that you can kind of you don't need to make a choice between you know english and the vernacular that they can exist side by side that mm. you can switch mm. we all do that in our speech like often when we are talking amongst yeah. friends or whatever you know thoda hindi aa jata hai ya there'll be like a certain mm. like if you are familiar with bangalore or whatever like you'll just say like hogi hogi or mm. you know something like that right yeah. so there will be smatterings of this macha <laughs> macha like all yeah, that yeah. so it will all come in in your speech but mm. it can also sort of occupy the same space in your head mm-hmm. where when necessary it can come in yeah yeah right and lastly like to kind of that you know talk about this and business mm. is that i feel that for a generation as i said who is so you know steeped in thinking in english like mm. it's you know that main thing is that we, we all and think in english think yeah. in english right that this could be a very cool entry point into kind of forming a relationship with your language mm. you know it could be the language when i say your language it could be the language at home it could be the language of your state it could be the language of your partner you know whatever but it's like let's start with like word by word phrase by phrase rather than sort of an imposition saying mm-hmm. you know me marathi zi marathi like you know that you have to mm-hmm. learn marathi because you're in maharashtra or that you have to have signage in karnataka in mm-hmm. kannada mm-hmm. but a more friendly a more you know kind of an approachable entry point mm. into saying okay like this word sounds interesting so now i know one kannada word or mm. now i know one punjabi phrase mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right and that i think is a very interesting process yeah yeah i remember like i was planning to name my dog nalak uh, and something more because nalak is like four in in uh, kannada right right and he has four legs so <laughs> like yeah i mean i just thought of that uh bridging the gap between these two things right yeah uh you have also said uh, like language is uh, a road map to the culture right a road map of the culture so can you tell us uh, what makes you say that and i mean uh, why do you value so much vernacular i mean you briefly touched upon it but just to elaborate on the same thing and what's what's the importance of these uh, uh languages apart from telling stories right so you know i mean i've heard some of your earlier uh, podcasts with various type designers and mm. everything right with all these foundries mm. that we speak about and everybody is in a way moving towards saying oh you know indian languages and we are developing type faces yeah. you know across like multilingual type type faces and all of that my uh, you know kind of question goes one level you know prior to that saying okay. that's great you know that's awesome that you are developing all these type faces but who is using them mm. the reason why it's not even you know such a greatly viable field mm-hmm. you know is because there is not that much demand mm mm-hmm. right but it's increasing so it's increasing but still by who mm-hmm. right because for instance if you go to a local newspaper mm-hmm. or you know to a kind of small city like dtp operator or whatever mm-hmm. whose primary mode is to design in vernacular languages mm-hmm. right somebody who's 
designing for a Marathi newspaper or magazine or like that, mm. they have tons of fonts available to them. Mm-hmm. Right. So my local, like this is how I started my career where I would go, you know, to a local typesetter and he would give me a book mm. and it would have Marathi that looks like, you know, Chinese for your like Chinese stall or whatever. And mm. it's like, it would have Marathi that's like, Achha, this is the impact. This is the Helvetica. This is this. So they mm. would have their own local versions of it. And you sort of like a menu selected from that book. And he would typeset mm-hmm. that for you. Mm-hmm. So the people who are actually using them have enough already. Mm. This market that we are trying to actually say that there is not enough and there needs to be more and all of that is the market who is actually not using the vernacular so much. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I am coming from a point saying let's create interest in the vernacular. Mm. Let's uh, kind of, you know, create a space Mm. whereby as Indians and as Indian designers especially, Mm. we have something unique to give to the world which nobody else already has. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it's a it's literally It's the gap. There's a gap, yeah. More than a gap that it's you know in this oversaturated design world Mm. right where everything that has to be done with Helvetica has been done 80 times over. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh what are you know how do we make our mark as indian designers mm. we look we've been looking kind of at a broader western spectrum for a very long time mm. let's kind of look inwards and you know try and find design na- narratives that come from here mm. because the one thing that ensures is that it'll be completely unique Hmm. That nobody else in the West can tap into that. Correct, correct, right? Yeah, that, that there's nobody outside of a, a, you know, Malayali household who will know that like what's like that super funny thing, you know, in saying Vipralam. Hmm. So Vipralam is actually like a happy excitement that you feel, you know, like a sort not a bad nervousness, but a good nervousness. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Mm. So it's like that and that word exists only in Malayalam that it's like I'm feeling vipralam. Mm. And <laughs> okay, okay, nice. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's through our conversation as you can tell that it's only like every time I hear something like this, mm. I pick it up, mm-hmm. right? And I will try and kind of fit it into my design context and mm. now you know and now hopefully everybody else who's listening will know one Malayalam word Mm -hmm. and one Gujarati phrase, Mm -hmm. right? And then people kind of will pick on to something. Correct, correct, correct. Right? Apart from that, so all this while I've been talking about, you know, the audio part of the Mm -hmm. words, Mm -hmm. there's also like, and what sort of connects it back to typography is the visual part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Our scripts are so incredibly beautiful and Mm. interesting that it feels a pity for them to have to die out. Mm -hmm. So again, when I was back in college, my thesis was on the extinction of Sanskrit. Mm. You know, and when Mm. I say extinction, I don't mean like a literal extinction. Mm. But apart from a few pundits and a few scholars or whatever, Sanskrit is no longer used. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's not uh, being used in the mainstream, definitely. Yeah, and when you look at, you know, old texts, when you look at how Sanskrit was written and what all it has led to, like including German has mm. a connection, like, you know, there are so many languages where the root is actually Sanskrit. Yeah, yeah. That it feels like, wow, that was something really rich, which we have let go of, mm-hmm. you know, both in terms of meaning as well as visually. Mm-hmm. That the Sanskrit is a lot like Hindi, but if you've ever seen Sanskrit texts, it sort of it has it's a ligature heaven. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that it's just like everything's connected in like double deckers and triple deckers and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So I just feel that as as scripts yeah. also they they have to really, really, you know, there's a wonderful visual repertoire and that has been like not even tip of the iceberg explored. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole world waiting out there to kind of type of typography design with 
Indian hmm. scripts. Hmm. Yeah, and again, uh, going back uh, to Sanskrit or for that matter, any of the other Indian languages which are on the verge of extinction or not being used in the mainstream, I think that demands like two, three another audio game sessions maybe <laughs> because it's quite intense. Absolutely. Um, so, Kruti, I would like to slightly change track here and ask you about uh, like the Dharavi Design Museum project which you worked on and uh, last couple of few questions I have and then um, yeah so can you tell us about the Dharavi yes. that logo which is there right now yes. on that website is it designed by you yes <laughs> wow it's very beautiful I really loved it it has uh, like a, a Devanagari and English right so yeah can you tell us about something about the Dharavi Design Museum project yeah so um, you know it's it, this also kind of opens up a larger question that I often get asked saying okay typography and all very nice mm. but you know what else because mm-hmm. you know typography alone like how much mm. can you now as a designer and you know again I would quote like Massimo over here saying that if you can do one thing you can do everything mm. that I don't think uh, a designer's mind is limited to just kind of one area of specialization it mm. may, it might be your kind of passion or your you know favored biased child mm-hmm. but there's always so many other opportunities yeah. that's waiting for you to happen correct and like that i had this chance to work with these uh, two you know artists from Amsterdam Mm. and uh, it's again you know this is look at how ironic it is that it takes somebody from outside to come in to show you your neighborhood Mm -hmm. so it was their project to you know start this design museum in Tharavi Mm. and I spent a year so they were here for a month but I spent the whole year then on ground at Tharavi seeing this project taking it forward Mm -hmm. The basic idea was that it was a museum for the people of Dharavi. Mm. So by the people, for the people kind of an idea. Mm. And there were design conversations, you know, where we sat on ground with them Mm. to say that, look, forget about, you know, demand and, you know, like dhanda and paisa banane ka. Mm. But if you were given a free reign, what would you actually design? Mm -hmm. And this was across potters and broom makers and, you know, the recycling guys and weavers and leather makers Mm. and all of that. Mm. So we went into each community, met like a whole bunch of makers Mm. and then sat with them as an at an equal level, like designer to designer and said, like, literally, like, we are just giving you space. Like, yes, we are the client, Mm. but we are we are the client who's saying like we don't have a brief like you do what you want to do mm-hmm. right so and then we took those products that they made whether it was the potters or whatever outside the pottery area in Dharavi so Dharavi is really like large mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and what is surprising is that it has so many kind of separate sectors mm-hmm. that people don't know what's really going on from one sector to another so we took the pottery exhibition into like you know the camp area Mm. where there was actually so much excitement because they had never seen it Mm. right they don't have the luxury to wander around in other parts speaking to other people's houses Mm. and also feel proud because it come from the same society but it of course it you know, comes from the same society, but it was more the wonder saying, oh, this was happening like so close to us, but we didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is so, so there was so much excitement. There was so much ownership, like you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, this whole idea, so there was, you know, there was the main thing was kids. And somebody once asked me, I think it was, uh, um, I can't remember who it was, but mm-hmm. they basically said, you know, so what's the point of this? So mm. they've seen it mm. and, you know, they are excited about it or mm. whatever. But what's what's the point of mm. what you're Utility doing? Of, yeah, yeah. Right. And my thing was that, you know, through the one year that I worked there, there were kids who would like come and look at things and say, Didi, kya kar rahe ho? And all of that. And then 
suddenly it became this that I would, you know, take time and explain to a bunch of kids. Mm. And then they would be explaining to each other, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. So there was this conversation I overheard between two kids. And, you know, one of them is saying, but what is this? You know, it's a cart. Like, what is this? What mm. does the museum mean? Mm. So this kid is saying that essentially it's a magic show. Mm. Without the tricks. Wow. wow. You know. <laughs> and it was nice. such a beautiful explanation. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that in whatever, you know, in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years time, if even five kids from Dharavi have a greater understanding of design, if, you know, whether they are the kids of the makers and they say, yes, we don't want to do another copy. We want to do our own thing. Mm. Or that they go out and they actually are able to say, we know what a museum is or we know something about design. Mm. For me, that project has done enough. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful. (laughs) And these are also, as I said, that it opens up when I said a larger conversation because I see my work currently moving from mainstream graphic design to more design for social change and social development. Those Mm -hmm. are also the kind of projects I'm currently working on. Mm -hmm. So that's where my interest lies. And it again, it ties up everything because it ties up the vernacular language. It ties up my, you know, thing for India and bringing about social change and bringing like using design as a tool to actually do all of this Mm -hmm. rather than you know doing social work in a normal sense and be a volunteer Mm -hmm. that I'm finding entry points into this field through what I'm good at Mm -hmm. and that feels awesome (laughs) yeah yeah truly um Kriti I would like to conclude with uh, one last question so uh, which is more towards understanding your vision or your uh, thoughts on the future is uh, like yeah what are your thoughts on typography of the future within the realm of Indian scripts I mean uh, since there is so much rich tradition already present right uh, Chas Chakoda <laughs> uh, to, to uh, the Malayalam phrase which you use right uh, what are your thoughts overall in preserving this or how can we just run, keep it running, keep nurturing it. So, um, you know, the world right now is moving at like such an alarming rate, right? And yeah. the way, you know, every single moment, every single morsel of food anybody is eating is being documented. Yeah. Now, the fear is that in all this excess of what is currently happening Mm. the record of what was history Mm. is you know will somewhere get lost in like this yeah this noise yeah right so i uh feel that you know that there is a lot there are a lot of people especially my contemporaries you know there are a lot of movements that are happening whether it's the type foundries whether it's culture shop whether it's you know, bunch of people who are doing India-focused design and kind of finding their own entry points into illustration, into typography, into street photography, history, all of that. Mm. So there is a considerable amount of work being done, Mm. but that somehow needs to be transferred to, you know, the generation who comes after us Mm -hmm. and as uh, you know Indian designers we sort of hold that responsibility Mm -hmm. I think the people who came before us the Mm -hmm. people who I studied under Mm -hmm. um, you know the Gita Narayanan of Shrishti who had Shrishti who I was lucky enough to study under and the Mahendra Bhai Patel and Mm -hmm. you know all these people they did such a fantastic job of passing that on to us Mm -hmm. Uh, we sometimes tend to get a bit overwhelmed with the pace at which everything is moving Mm, because you know the the kids I teach these days will be like oh you don't know Snapchat oh like you know I have 40,000 followers on Instagram Mm -hmm. so there is like there's a shift happening from learning to kind of just doing and sharing Mm -hmm. and if somewhere we can still you know, manage to pass that on, like Mm. pass on, 
you know, the baton literally of saying, look, there's a lot more mm. to learn. There's a lot more to discover. There always will be. Mm-hmm. And that is far more enriching, at least for me and at least in my vision, mm-hmm. than just, you know, taking a picture of something and just sharing without mm-hmm. thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, people have become less uh, reflective anyways, like just yeah. what they are doing, what is happening but yeah it's a different, different so so while we have the tools for recording and preservation which are more advanced than ever mm-hmm. our attention span and our interests are becoming more limited mm-hmm. and uh, i feel that again if that bri- you know gap could be bridged mm-hmm. it would actually like you'd have explosive stuff that would come out of yeah. this yeah Brilliant, brilliant. I remember one uh, quote by Pula Deshpande where he said that when the when the new technology was just coming into India where you could uh, actually record songs on a tape recorder, uh, a lot of people did that. But nobody really thought of actually recording a classroom session which is happening and then come home and just listen to it again. So it's just a, a better use of uh, the same stuff. So maybe... The technology is just empowering us to do more things, but I think the way we use it maybe uh, help what you just mentioned about passing on that rich tradition to the next uh, generation. And point in case, like, you know, that's what uh, you are doing, Mm -hmm. that you, you know, you're really using this to record something, to record like the voices of, uh, you know, just a time. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's literally that I can plug into this even five years from now and get a sense of, you know, what was the thinking pattern at that time yeah. across filmmakers, across designers, across, you know, musicians, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just get a sense of history yeah. through yeah. that. Yeah. But it's like the fact that we have the luxury of recording history as it happens Mm -hmm. versus some historian you know who had to like sit and kind of piece together things is fantastic so I really think what uh, you know you're doing is just great and you know thank you for like really giving this to all of us (laughs) thank you thank you uh, cool. I think this is a good note to end this. Uh, I get. I mean, I understand there are a lot of things to be discussed, but it's yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you for giving us your time again, and it was lovely talking to you. Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's it. And that's it from today's Gyan session. Catch us on iTunes, Savan, Stitcher, or any podcasting app you use. Do rate us on iTunes and follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Stay tuned for more Gyan on audiogyan.com. Till then, bye!